Hello, I'm Dr. Thomas Hitchcock, and welcome to this episode of our series, Beauty and the Bacteria, an exploration into the world of the skin microbiome. In this series, we are taking a closer look at the entangled nature of our skin's relationship to the microbes that live on and in the skin, and how that affects our lives from birth till death. In our last episode, we discussed where exactly our skin gets its first microbes, and how this could shape not only how our microbiome develops, but also our body's immune responses when entering our bacteria-filled world. We also looked at how the interaction of our skin microbiome with our human cells may be much more significant than once was thought because of our understanding of the vastly larger surface areas due to the millions of secondary structures like hair follicles and sweat glands. And we talked about how these types of bacteria that live in our bodies and how they can combine into uniquely different microbiomes that inhabit the different regions of the skin and how some skin sites microbiomes compositions are more similar or different than others due to the similarities in skin environment. <laughs> in this episode, we'll take these ideas further and then look even deeper into the skin to see what is found there. We'll look at why the microbiome might differ when we look deeper and why this might be one of the more critical aspects of how we achieve symbiosis. As we've previously discussed, we once thought the womb was a sterile environment. Likewise, we also had the perception that the skin was a barrier for entry when it comes to microbes. We thought that other than on the surface, in the stratum corneum and maybe the upper epidermis, that the tissues of the body were relatively sterile. Again, this was until the advent of 16S sequencing, which has now showed us that bacteria can inhabit the whole of the skin from top to bottom into the adipose or fat tissues and even beyond. And I'm not talking about only in exceptional cases, like with infections, but in normal, healthy individuals. So why is this important to consider? Well, let's take a look at a given example of some research that explored the bio burden of or amounts of bacteria in the different layers of the skin. Here you can see a histological cross-section of palm skin. This is from a journal article cited here. Note the thick red topmost layer, which is the stratum corneum, and the pink layer just below it, which is the epidermis. The graph to the right denotes the relative amounts of bacteria that were detected using 16S sequencing. The longer the blue line on the x-axis, the more bacteria that was detected at that depth in the skin. Now, it should be noted that the researchers surgically scrubbed the skin before biopsy, so much of the surface microbiomes would have been removed. Yet, as you can see, there is indeed bacteria in the stratum corneum and epidermis layers, as we might have expected due to their proximity to the outside of the skin, though less relative amounts that might be expected normally. However, what was not expected was that the bacteria was detected even deep into the dermis, as deep as two millimeters. Now, as we discussed, secondary structures like sweat glands and hair follicles can be conduits for bacteria to travel from the surface into the deeper parts of the skin. But this is deeper than the sweat glands in this image is located. So this is suggesting that there is a significant number of bacteria that have found their way into the deepest layers of skin, even without a direct conduit like the sweat gland. Speaking of conduits, let's take a look at the same study where a cross section of a hair follicle was examined for bacterial 16S rRNA signal. Here you can see the relative number of bacteria is greatest towards the bottom of the hair follicle. Now, again, the surface was scrubbed, so it's hard for us to directly compare numbers of bacteria that would normally reside in the uppermost regions versus the deeper colonies reflected here. Regardless, we can see that there is a huge number of bacteria that reside in the follicle. Note the logarithmic scale, indicating how large the bacterial population is within the bottom of the follicle. 
And this is very important since the follicle, as we discussed, make up the vast majority of the surface area of the skin, based off the calculations we looked at in the previous episode. So the types of bacteria that are thriving within each hair follicle are very important to the health of the skin, as they have the most access to human cells, and importantly, the immune system compared to the microbes that hang out on the surface. So what are the microbes that live in the hair follicle? Well, as you can imagine, the environment of the follicle plays a huge role in determining which microbes might call it home. We know that the follicle is filled with oils or sebum from the sebaceous glands, and these oils are what help to seal our skin from the environment. Also, the deeper into the follicle we go, the less direct access to air and oxygen. So the bacteria that would do best would be the ones that can thrive in our skin oils and don't require much, if any, oxygen. As it stands, one of the major components of the skin microbiome fit that bill, and that is from the genus Cutobacterium. And yes, it is the C. acne species of microbes that make up the vast majority of bacteria who call the hair follicle home. As can be seen from this graph from a paper in 2012 by Dr. Huang Li's group at UCLA, an average of 87% of all bacteria in the hair follicle was made up of C. acnes. Now to get this data, a simple swab would not be sufficient. As we discussed before, a swab would only represent the microbiome composition on the surface. To determine the makeup of the follicular microbiome, we need to employ a sampling technique that goes deeper. So they remove the surface microbes and use adhesives, such as a Biore strip, to pull out the contents of the pores. And this is what they get. What you think of as gross gunk that you want gone is actually a treasure trove of data for a skin microbiome scientist. Back to the graph. As you can see, in both acne and normal populations, there are people with near to and even at 100% of the follicle microbiota being composed of C. acnes. And this finding was indeed very interesting, because C. acnes used to be considered the reason for acne and thus targeted for eradication in order to cure acne. But here we see evidence that not only does everybody have C. acnes in their follicles, but that it makes up a vast majority of the microbiome of the follicle. And it has been purported that little, if any, C. acnes lives on the skin of pre-adolescent humans. But could it be that we've just been sampling incorrectly? If we look deeper, maybe we'll find that C. acnes is always there, from our mother's womb. It just hasn't surfaced yet. Now, this data might get you asking some very interesting questions, such as, how is it that everyone has C. acnes in their skin in large numbers, yet we don't all have acne all the time? Well, that's a larger topic for another episode, but for now, just know that C. acnes is suggested by recent evidence to be by far the most prevalent bacteria of the skin microbiome with the most access to the human cells and the immune system, and therefore is in the running for being the most important species of bacteria in the skin microbiome. With C. acnes ruling the depths of the skin, it is corneobacteria and Staphylococcus species, such as Staph epidermidis, that make up much of the surface bacteria, with some C. acnes that is pushed up with the oil as it is deposited on the skin. But which of these bacteria are bad, and which ones are good? Well, it isn't as simple as that. Early research labeled species such as Staphylococcus epidermidis as good and C. acnes as bad. But we now know more information about the significant differences in strains of bacteria even within a single species. And it has been reported that the species Staph epidermidis is the most frequent cause of hospital-derived sepsis. And as we just talked about, C. acnes has been unjustly vilified as a cause of acne. Yet people without acne have tons of C. acnes living on their skin all the time. Just like my favorite story, the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Many strains of bacteria hold the potential for good and bad, but it's becoming clear that each species might have several strains with distinct physiological activities which might be considered good or bad, depending on when and where those activities take place. And as we move forward to thinking about how to modulate the skin microbiota as a therapeutic way to address skin disease, knowing which strains, not just species, to target might be quite critical.
critical. So what does all this mean for the health of the skin? Well, the first thing we can take away is that the skin microbiome is more than a surface thing. While you can reduce numbers of bacteria by washing or scrubbing, wiping with alcohol or washing with benzoyl peroxide, you will never ever get rid of your microbiome. So if we can't get rid of it, we need to take care of it. As we talked about earlier, it isn't easy to change the skin microbiome once you're an adult without changing habits and the products you use long term. But it is possible, and more and more we're seeing ideas and even products that are getting us closer to being able to do this in a targeted fashion. Techniques such as microbiome transplants have been tested and it has been observed that transplants of bacteria from one donor to a recipient does begin to shift the recipient's microbiome makeup after repeated and consistent application. The real question is, how long do we need to do this before it takes, before we get engraftment? Furthermore, to do this, one would need to know which microbes to get rid of and which ones to add. And while we don't know all of the answers yet, it seems we are getting quite close to a place where this type of skin therapy is an everyday reality. And that, my friends, concludes this discussion on the skin microbiome and why we shouldn't just scratch the surface, but we should truly look skin deeper. As always, we love hearing from you. So please send your questions, comments, or topics that you'd like us to cover to comments at beautyandthebacteria.com. You can also follow us on our social media listed here to watch our Q&A sessions, interviews, or to send us your questions and to receive updates on this series, as well as other news and information on skin microbiome initiatives at Crown. So from all of us here at Crown Laboratories, thank you for watching. And remember, you have billions of bacteria on your face, and we think that's awesome. Goodbye for now.